Welcome to Right Now Workshop Podcast, where you can write a book and change the world. I'm your host, Kitty Buholtz, and this is episode 271, Planning Your Books and Career, an interview with Betsy St. Amant, coming to you on Thursday, November 4th, 2021. I just met Betsy, but I'm pretty sure we're going to have to be friends for life. She is so fun. We laughed and talked and hopefully entertained you a lot as she gave some insights and some tips and a little bit of advice and helpful things that I think could help you with your writing career. Um, We talked about coffee, food, figuring out what books to write next, food, critique partners, food in our books. It was very fun. You will very much enjoy this episode. In fact, I would say that if you enjoy this episode, you should definitely try her book, Tacos for Two, because I found the book as enjoyable as talking to Betsy. Very fun. It's out now, so you can go ahead and purchase it when you're ready. I'm reading it, really enjoying it. And uh, yeah, if you like romantic comedies and and just like the humor that's always in these books, you will love this interview. So <laughs> I hope that you jo- enjoy it. Uh, remember that um, there's a lot of writing going on right now. So if you are participating in National Novel Writing Month at nanorimo.org, feel free to find me, Kitty Buholtz. It's just my name with a space in between. And um, make me uh, one of your writing buddies. Uh, you'll probably have to send me a message um, Um, in order for me to know that you uh, friended me on purpose. Otherwise, I'll be like, I don't know, random people just friending me that I don't know. Just tell me, I'm one of your listeners. Let's be podcast, let's be nano buddies. And um, we can try to um, outdo each other's word count by at least one word every day. (laughs) That's what I always try to do. I look at my friends. I'm like, she wrote 1,272 words and I'm at 1,200. I bet I can write 74 words. (laughs) So whether you're doing nano or not, happy writing. Remember that you have important things to say that could change somebody's life. You might make somebody feel better who's having a bad day. You might teach somebody teach somebody something that they really needed to know in that moment. Something that you have inside you that's coming out in your book, it needs to be done. So keep writing, finish your book, and enjoy this interview as a little bit of a break in between writing sessions. Have a great day. Here's Betsy. Today's guest is Betsy St. Amant. Betsy is the author of more than 15 inspirational romances, including The Key to Love and a frequent contributor to iBelieve.com. She lives in North Louisiana with her husband, two daughters, a collection of Austin novels, and an impressive stash of pickle-flavored Pringles. When she's not composing her next book or trying to prove unicorns are real, Betsy can usually be found somewhere in the vicinity of a white chocolate mocha no-whip. Welcome, Betsy. Hi, thanks so much for having me. It's so good to be here. Oh, it's so fun to talk to you. And I have to say for anyone who's not watching on YouTube, Betsy is drinking. Tell us, Betsy. This is actually, I, I veered from the usual because calories. <laughs> I, uh, this one is a cold brew with cold foam, vanilla sweet cream cold foam. So it does the trick. <laughs> Excellent. You know, not a coffee drinker. So I hear words coming out of your mouth and I'm like, okay, good. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> Yes, I'm pretty high maintenance. We were actually at a Starbucks out of town a couple of weeks ago, me and my husband, and um, I get up to the counter and it's one of those hotel Starbucks that serve Starbucks, but they're not a Starbucks. So it's always a limited menu. And I just look at the poor guy and I was like, Hey, I'm going to be a little high maintenance. I'm sorry in advance. And he's like, it's okay. And I said, do you have sweet cream? He's like, yes. And then he said, okay, do you have cold foam? And he's like, yes. I said, you have vanilla cold foam? And he's like, yes. I said, you are my hero. Like, this is going to be easy from here. And then my husband steps up and he's like, coffee, small, black. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. Yeah, that happened. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I'm like that with food. Can I get that without onions? Like, is that okay? The onions aren't cooked into it. Yeah, okay, good. And could I put the, um, could I put the sauce on the side, like in my own little dish so that I can decide how much I want it? Oh, good. Thank you so much. Is it possible that we add pine nuts to that? Oh, great. Thank you so much. (laughs) That's great. I love it. You know what you want. That's good. (laughs) See, thank you. That's how I look at it. Now I have learned something just this last week. 
um, actually it was Saturday. My husband was off with his friends and they were going to have lunch out. And I said, Oh, I'm going to get something from, from a restaurant too, and bring it home while I watch TV or something. And, um, and okay. I live in Sweden, lived here over three years. I've been trying my best to learn Swedish as best I can, but my business is in English. I speak English to people who speak English. It's, and when I speak very bad Swedish to someone at a store, they just switch to English because they, they understand. <laughs> and I realize that some of them, depending on the age, like they're just excited to be able to speak English because they don't always get to some people speak it all yeah. the time. Other people, not as much. So, so my Swedish is very bad. So I'm at the restaurant and I'm like, <laughs> could I get that risotto, you know, without onions? And could we by any chance add pine nuts? And he was like, what? And I said, pine nuts. <laughs> and he's like the little, and I said, yeah, the little nuts. And, he, and he's like, yeah, that's, um, and I don't know if this is exactly how you say it, but he's like, Volnut. Volnut. okay, Volnut. I'll remember that Volnut. So I'm sitting in front of the TV. I've got this great movie on, I'm eating my risotto. It's just me and the remote control. <laughs> and I'm like, what? what did I just put in my mouth? Like, is there a (laughs) bone or something? Is there a piece of chicken bone? And and I'm now I'm digging through the risotto. I'm like, what is this? And I'm at first scared. I'm like, is it a bug? (laughs) (laughs) And then I'm like kind of poking at it with my fork and knife. And I'm like, no way. I put it in my mouth. It's a walnut. Who put walnuts in risotto? (laughs) Turns out pine nut, walnut. I should have learned the word that I really wanted the item. Oh Oh my gosh. That's so stressful. (laughs) But I learned something new. And then I learned that some of my friends are like, yeah, I put walnuts in my risotto. I'm like, really? Really? Yeah. Yeah, Thank you. That's the same face I had. (laughs) (laughs) So super excited. I need to let you have a chance to talk because I'm excited. You write romantic comedies and you have tons of food in your books. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> so tell us, tell us, how did you get started? Tell us a little bit about you, how you, how you got into writing and then how you got into romantic comedies. Great. Okay. So writing wise, I started writing when I was seven, my dad brought home our first family computer. He worked in um, it. So he had access to stuff from his work and he brought home this big boxy DOS, you know, machine. And um, I started just typing out little short stories kind of like almost like a a journal, but in third person, like about a girl and her dog or no plots, just (laughs) trying to get there, you know? Um, And then I kind of eased into fan fiction, but I didn't realize fan fiction was a thing. I just thought, Ooh, babysitters club books. I can write one of those and have the characters do what I want. (laughs) So I started playing with that, you know, and then really, I think it kicked up when I was a teenager and I read Robin Jones gun Glenbrook series. And then of course the Christy Miller, and I just loved the romance of it. I loved the, the purity and the wholesomeness and how Robin Jones gun is just a master of kind of blending the earthly romance and the heavenly romance. So as a Christian reader, that really appealed to me, you know, being able to see how all of that connects and how our, our earthly love can be a representation and a a symbol of our heavenly father's love. And I just loved it. It was so inspiring. And I wanted to make other readers, especially women feel that same hope and encouragement of, you know, waiting for Mr. Right or, um, you know, just, I don't know. I just loved the wholesomeness of it. And so I started just devouring, um, Christian romance and thought, okay, babysitter's club, saddle club, it's not really doing it for me anymore. You know, I'm going to branch out into this. And so I kind of went that route for a while. And I started playing around with my very first novel, romantic suspense that is in a drawer and never needs to see the light of day (laughs) because (laughs) it is so horrific, but it taught me a lot. And I rewrote that poor story. It went through first person. It went through third person. I actually had a critique done by a, um, a very well-known author who was offering services at the time for editing. Um, and she taught me so much and it was so fun, but that book will never see the light of day. Uh, but that was kind of my launching point. And I thought, okay, the next book, 
that's going to be it. I'm going to really try to get published. So by now I was probably about 18 and I thought, okay, if I want to be published, I've got to figure this out. I've got to go to a conference. I've got to learn how this works. You know, um, it's kind of easy to sit at home and type on your computer, but when it comes to the industry, you know, a lot of times authors don't know where to start. They're like, do I need an agent? Do I need to hire an editor? There's all those questions. So I went to a conference and it was actually a speaking conference, but they had this little, small, tiny sub workshop on fiction writing. And it was taught by author Gail Roper. Oh, wow. Who, yes. <laughs> and so I connected with her and um, just kind of explained, you know, where I was at and her class was wonderful, of course. So I made this huge rookie mistake when I got home. I emailed Gail Roper, not knowing how these things work. She's so sweet and she was so, so gracious, but I emailed her and said, could you just read my whole novel and like, give me feedback? Like, <laughs> could you just do that? <laughs> I was so young and naive and oh my gosh, bless her heart. She was so sweet. And she's like, well, I really can't work that into my schedule right now. But here's what you need to do. And she directed me to the ACFW, the American Christian Fiction Writers. And that was the launching point for my whole writing career. Um, Gail calls me her youngest success story. We still <laughs> keep up today. I, I tag her on Facebook posts every time. I'm just so grateful for her because if the Lord hadn't used her to kind of show me that path, I might still be writing fan fiction and not knowing what to do. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. So when I joined the ACFW, I got my agent through a conference. Um, she sold my first book to Love Inspired a couple of months later. And that was about 14 years ago. That's crazy. Wow. Um, I was expecting my, my daughter when I got my first Love Inspired contract and she's 13. So I guess that's wow. the math. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so, yeah. so you didn't write for Love Inspired Suspense first. You started out with a, a straight love story. Yeah. Yes, I uh, wrote, I think, eight for their love and um, their just romance line. Um, and then I really wanted to write the, the trade link stories. I loved Love Inspired, but, um, you know, that's a smaller word count, a couple of different parameters. And so I was like, OK, I have some bigger stories I need to find an outlet for. And that was when I got my first contract with Zondervan and it was for All's Fair and Love and Cupcakes. <laughs> and that was what first started the whole food run. <laughs> So nice. Yeah. I love it. Okay. I haven't read that one, but your brand new book that, um, when this comes out, okay. I actually don't know the date yet that this will come out, but your brand new book came out October 14th and it's called tacos for two. Yes. Yes. So tell us about the tacos because this morning I woke up, I, I uh, went to sleep reading your book and then I woke up had a dream. I was like, Oh, now I have to go back to the book again. Cause I'm obviously still thinking about it. I had a dream <laughs> about cheese and I was, I was giving a workshop on cheese, uh, everything about cheese. And I know it's because <laughs> Grady was, uh, was shredding cheese or Jude, um, oh, somebody no. was shredding cheese when I fell asleep last night. So tell us about oh, the tacos. How, how did this story <laughs> come to be? That is great. And I love that you said that because a lot of the reviews that are already hitting Amazon and stuff um, are talking about how hungry this book is making them. So yeah. you're the first, I think, to have a food dream from the novel, but that's amazing. Um, yeah. So talk us for two. It actually came out October 12th. 12. Okay. Um, which was perfect because that was a Tuesday. So it was the best taco Tuesday that it could have been. Right. Uh, yes. It worked out really well. Um, so it's been really fun to promote because of the taco element. I'm having a lot of fun with this book. Um, I mean, of course, it's always fun when you have a new book come out, but something about this one has been a little unique. I just didn't realize how many people love tacos. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's been a lot of fun on social media, just interacting with you know readers and, and seeing all the food quotes and the reviews. Um, but yeah, so Tacos for Two is set in a food truck and I like to call it You've Got Mail Meets Food Truck Wars because there's a huge You've Got Mail um, vibe, I guess you could say through the story. It's not a true retelling. Um, I did kind of take it and make it my own, but there's a lot of nods to that, you know, fabulous movie. That's one of my favorites. Yeah. So I think if you're a fan of You've Got Mail, you're going to get something extra out of tacos for two but if you haven't seen the movie 
you're not going to be confused or miss anything, but it might inspire you to go watch it because yeah. it's so great. Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan, it's just the best. <laughs> go to the mattresses. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so fun. So, um, yeah, so I kind of got out of the bakery. A lot of my books um, in recent years kind of featured some kind of baking element, whether it was the, the cupcakes, which was a reality show contest, or um, the key to love was my release last year with Ravel. And it was um, kind of the love locks in Paris. This um, girl in middle of nowhere, Kansas has a Parisian style bakery and a love lock wall outside the bakery that goes viral and brings in a scorned travel writer who is very much Gerard Butler in my heart. Nice. And <laughs> <laughs> so that one was really fun too, um, just to do all the pedophores and the macarons and all the things I can't make in real life to save my life. But <laughs> it was fun to research and have my characters make them. Yeah. I have to just um, let you know, just out of the goodness of my heart, if you need any more um, Parisian, Parisian bakery research, just let me know because I'm happy to get on a plane. It's only two hours away. Uh, the first two times, basically all the times I've been there, I've either been there two or three times. I can't remember for some reason. I don't know why I can't remember, but um, I fell in love with the food. Like I did not think that Paris at all was a city for lovers. I thought it was really dirty and had a lot of graffiti and didn't really smell very good <laughs> unless you were passing a bakery. And then I was like, Oh my gosh, this is my there place. Is. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's better when carbs get involved, you know? <laughs> oh, right. And then mix the carb chocolate with the carb butter and yeah. Yep. <laughs> so, Thanks. so is Ravel a kind of, um, like, do you have a, a plan to write food books or is it just ha kept happening accidentally and they kept accidentally saying yes? Yeah. So I've had several publishers over the years. I started with, you know, Love Inspired. I had a young adult novel with Barber. Um, and then I went to Zondervan, did a couple with them, did some uh, novella sets. And it's kind of funny the way this escalated. I feel like I've been accidentally branded as, you know, the bakery author because, uh, that just started happening. So for example, uh, Zondervan asked some of their authors to do a novella set a couple of years ago, and it was a year in weddings. And they had, um, there's actually two sets. And we did one that was each, each bride, January bride, February bride, March bride. And I was February bride. So there's a bakery theme in that one because it just felt natural at the time, weddings, you know. Well, then they did another set. And this time they assigned me um, love takes the cake. So it was a set with all the different jobs that go into a wedding, the caterer, the cake baker, the, the florist, the dress shop. And so everyone kind of was assigned their, their profession. Yeah. And I got, the, I got the baker. So it just kind of kept escalating. And I just was like, well, we'll just go with it. Yeah. But I was thinking recently though, it's really fun because I love the concept of love starts in the kitchen, you know, and just all the opportunities for humor, for conflict, you know, maybe you're trying to save the restaurant or the bakery. Maybe there's a, like a, a competitor who's, you know, coming up against you. There's just a lot of opportunity there to go a lot of different ways. And it provides a really natural setting for description and all those yummy food, you know, <laughs> descriptions and stuff. So it's been fun. But when we were brainstorming, I was brainstorming with my editor at Ravel. We had just done the key to love and I had a two book contract. So I'm thinking, okay, what's this next book going to be? And my editor actually said, you know, I just don't see any food trucks in Christian fiction. We should, we should do something with food trucks. And my first thought was, Ooh, challenge accepted. I'm going to get out <laughs> of the bakery into a food truck. This is going to be great. Um, and it was really fun. So I, I kind of stayed on brand, but I was able to branch out a little and do something different. And I think it went really well. So. Yeah. Oh, very nice. I have to say one of my favorite John Favreau films, I'm a huge John Favreau fan um, before Marvel, but after all of the Marvel movies, I'm like, I love you, John Favreau. <laughs> but he's got a movie called Chef, where this chef gets just torn apart, kind of deservedly, uh, by a food critic. Um, 
blah, 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 things happen. I don't want to ruin it for you. And he ends up in a food truck and it is so heartwarming and just so like, it's got plenty of conflict, trust me, plenty of conflict, but (laughs) somehow it's like all of these people who aren't mean and horrible and hate each other. They just have a lot of conflicts and, uh, and it's just, I don't know, the writing and the acting and, and also it makes you hungry and (laughs) yeah, yeah, you have have to to look that up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that sounds great. I love it. <laughs> oh, now, so <clears throat> the audience listening is going to be um, made up of traditionally published authors, self-published authors, and hybrid people who are doing both. So for people um, in either corner, uh, like any of those three areas, there's a certain amount of um, thought that usually goes into choosing the next books um, in a series or the next series of books. Um, Mm -hmm. Tell us how you and your agent and or editor, because I know some agents are very involved and some less involved, and I don't know about yours. um, how, How much of a plan are you actively thinking about um it's going to be this kind of food it's going to be different so that you know like um at one point i remember uh hallmark um uh, tweeted uh, these are the things we don't want to see any more of for the next year please because they had too many it was bakeries and cupcakes and <laughs> you know yeah. but so, so tell <laughs> us about the process of uh either your own brainstorming or then as you're working up levels through the organizations okay So my agent really, we don't brainstorm together. She handles, you know, everything else for me. um, And she reviews my proposals before we go out and gives amazing feedback. But when it comes to brainstorming, that's not normally what, what we do together. So in this case, when I was under the two book deal, I brainstormed with my editor at Ravel and that was really fun. But for the most part, ideas are usually coming just from me. And I have a critique partner who has been my buddy since, oh my goodness, probably 15 to 17 years now. Wow. And so we critique for each other, each book as we write it. So Mm -hmm. I'll finish the chapter and send it to her. She'll do some, oh, you have this typo. Oh, this didn't make sense. I'm, you know, give me the good feedback, send it back. And it's really encouraging to have her, you know, to brainstorm with, to um, just cheer me on as I write. Because, you know, you're so much more motivated to just sit down and get that next scene pounded out when you know someone's waiting on it. Yeah. So I really would encourage, you know, brainstorming and and critique partners, because not only is it just helpful to have another brain (laughs) helping you, you know, think of things and dream, but also just for that motivation. So I give a lot of credit to her for just for just listening to me, you know ramble on we we joke her name is Georgiana and we joke about we'll get stuck on something like plot wise we're like oh this isn't working this motivation doesn't quite feel authentic you know whatever it might be and so we use the Voxer app V-O-X-E-R and it's kind of like a walkie-talkie but you, you can listen to each other live or if you aren't available you can play it back later but it's a voice recording and it's just more personal than texting you know yeah and so we'll go for a walk or, you know, whatever. And I'll, um, I'll be like, okay, I'm just going to talk this out. You know, tell me what you think. And half the time, by the time I just say it all out loud to her, I've already thought of the answer <laughs> and she's yeah. just the sounding board on the other end. So just knowing you have someone there can really help your own writing process. Um, so yeah, so I have, I have her and then kind of thinking like forecast, I don't go too far forward with like you said, I'm going to do a food theme or I'm going to do this. I kind of keep it one book at a time. Okay. I think some of that's for my own sanity <laughs> and also just kind of in it, of an industry reality right now, you don't really know when or where the next contract's going to come from. So you could have all these plans and dreams, but if you can't get recontracted at your current house, you might need to do something different or you might get a contract with a different house and then they have a different vision. So I try not to get too far ahead of myself, just personally, that's the way I operate. Yeah. Now I think, so uh, what I think I saw on your website might've been just a a lucky accident then. Did you have two love inspired books that were set in the same town? Because it was an unusual name. So I was like, wait, I just read a book description further up on the website with, I'm sure it was the same town name. (laughs) Yeah, I have two Love Inspired. It was my my last two that I did for them back in 2013 and 2014. 
and it was um, the ranchers, the ranchers, I'm looking at my title over here on the thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the rancher next door and the rancher secret son. So those were both set in the same small town. Um, one of them was set on a, um, a ranch that served as a um, kind of like a boot camp for kids that are misbehaving and need to kind of get straightened out because they might be going to juvie otherwise. Uh -huh. And so it was the rancher who runs that program for kids and then the single mom who has to bring her kid to the ranch. Um, so that one was really fun. And then there's some um, cameo re repeat side characters from the rancher next door, which features a female firefighter and a single dad. So <laughs> sweet. Nice. So was that more just an example of, um, uh, they've offered me another contract and Hey, what do you think about, do you just say, what do you think about setting it in the same town? Yeah. You can always, you know, pitch those ideas. Um, you know, the thing with sequels and related books is you're, you almost limit yourself. So for example, my my two book deal with Sonderman was All's Fair and Love and Cupcakes and Love Arrives in Pieces. And those were also in the same town, but um, it was a story of, of sisters. So the sister in this book showed up as this, you know, in the next novel, but just very mildly, there wasn't a, a lot of repeat. It wasn't, to me, it wasn't a true sequel. It was just a little familiar. Yeah. Um, but, you know, sales wise, it's kind of like if the first book doesn't do fabulous, you're kind of pigeonholed at that point. The second book is just going to do worse, you know, because yeah. unless the, unless it's something really familiar that the, that the reader is really connected with. So there's just a risk there. Readers love series and sequels, but as my editor once explained to me, it's just a little bit of a risk, especially when you're still trying to build your readership. Um, so what we did with my Ravel contract was I thought very wise for our situation was we did a two book deal, completely unrelated, no ties, no, you know, nothing similar at all. So that way, if the first book didn't do as well, we'd have a fresh start with the second one for a whole new audience. Yeah. So I see pros and cons both ways. And you just have to kind of feel that out with your editor, with your agent, you know, yeah, that would be my advice. And, um, I think that the, uh, the ideas that you're talking about here, um, are similar in self-publishing in as much as readers love, um, uh, a series that are either related or, um, chronological or whatever, uh, all the different ways that you can build a series. Um, but you do have to, at that point, if you've written a book that just sells so, so then you're probably going to have to, if you want to continue with the series to keep on building that, uh, that series loving readership, you're probably going to have to just like suck it up for another book or so until you can get people back to being like, oh yeah, no, I still do really love you. But <laughs> I think that, um, so many times it's, it's just different for every author and every series. And you yeah. just have to have, um, kind of a, um, plan for, and this is not what I mean, because my first thought, um, you know, in my in my own writerly negative self-talk, you know, my first thought was a plan for failure, not what I mean, <laughs> but a plan for, um, okay, so if this doesn't work, um, I still have a plan and it's going yeah. to be, um, you know, positive and it's going to be still great books that I love to write. Yeah, exactly. Kind of plan for the unexpected. Is yeah, how I would say it, <laughs> but no, exactly. I get what you mean. Our first yeah, yeah. thoughts are like, "This is gonna fail. This is gonna be horrible." <laughs> <laughs> now, have you had any books where you did something different enough that you were like, "Oh man, I don't know how this is gonna go"? Well, I was honestly a little nervous with Tacos for Two because it was different. It wasn't bakery and and, and cupcakes and more on that side, but mainly the cover. And oh. I am so excited that my publisher made that decision because when we started discussing covers, um, you know, way back, they, the marketing team called me and they're like, we really want to do the illustrated route. Like that's really trendy right now. We think that might, you know, jump off the shelf, get you some more readers that wouldn't normally know of you, yeah, but would be drawn to this, you know, kind of trendy illustrated cover. And um, I was like, okay. And there's that little part of me that's like, but I love the traditional covers. I love the, 
the characters on the front and then the watermarks and the background and the zoo, you know, like, I just love that so much, but something in my spirit was like, trust them. They know what they're doing. So I said, okay, let's go for it. You know, this is a whole different book. This is a chance, you know, and also we were coming off the pandemic where sales were just so weird during 2020 yeah. and having the key to love come out in 2020. It was just really scary. <laughs> you know, everything was different and, you know, sales were kind of low for everybody and you didn't know what to expect. So I thought if we're going to really mix something up, this is the time. So they started sending me mock-ups of the, the illustrated cover options and all the taco trucks and the fun fonts. And I was like, Oh, this is brilliant. So they did a great job, but that was a huge difference for me that I didn't know at the time how it was going to go. Was it going to be a good risk? You know, but I think it paid off really well. I think this cover has gotten a lot of attention. I've even had reviewers, <laughs> a couple of reviewers from NetGalley, you know, who aren't always necessarily your target audience, but who yeah. think the book looks good. I've had a handful of people say, man, that cover, I didn't love the story, but that cover's amazing. <laughs> you know, you still, you still got it. Okay. Yeah. So, it's yeah, funny. I'm, win. Yeah. I'm a, I'm an old, uh, chick, chicklet reader from, you know, the, when it first started and love the illustrated col- covers love. Um, you know, I'm not a huge fan of pink, but I love your bright yellow cover. I lived in uh, Arizona and California for a while. I saw your cover and I'm like, it's Cinco de Mayo two for one margarita night, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which Christian fiction, you probably don't have margaritas. I'm only like 30% in, but I can't even believe I saw the word tequila in a Christian book. I'm like, she was allowed to write the word tequila. In there? <laughs> but yeah, I love the cover. I love it. Thank you. Yeah. I actually shared on social media the other day, the other mock-up that we were kind of torn between. Yeah. We were going to go between these two. And obviously we chose the yellow with the flowers and the food truck window close up. But I shared the other one and was like, what do y'all think? And everyone loved it, but there was a general um, agreement that, oh yeah, the one y'all went with was the better choice, but the other one was still really cute. So I, I felt like it was kind of a win-win, but I love, sh- I love sharing that kind of stuff with readers, you know, just from a marketing standpoint, I think readers love that behind the scenes. Any, anytime you can tell them something in the know, you know, I think that gets a lot of good results and it's, and it's authentic, you know, it's fun. It's not just, oh, I'm doing this. So you'll buy my book. You know, right. sometimes we do have to make posts like that, but whenever I get to really interact with readers or, you know, on social media, be like, what do y'all think? Or ask a poll question. It's so much fun. And I feel like the response from that is really better than anything that you could hire out or try to do fancy, you know? Yeah. So, you know, um, you and I had decided beforehand that we would probably have the, the best interview if we just chatted two writers talking about writing, which means that pretty much every time you say something interesting, I'm going to be like, hey, let's talk about that some more. So since everybody listening is probably a writer, uh, let's talk a little bit about reader interaction and the things that you've found that have worked really well for you. Yeah. So like I said, just being genuine, um, I... Long story short, I promise. Um, <laughs> I went through a divorce um, several years ago. I actually got that first Zondervan contract a few weeks after my ex husband left. Oh, wow. So that was, yeah, that was a journey getting this dream contract with my dream publisher to write a two, two romance novels, and I'm suddenly a single mom. Yeah. Not what I expected. But going through that journey, you know, really showed me what true love really was. And, you know, as a, as a Christian, that was a a huge part of my own spiritual walk. Um, and so that whole journey turned into me just pouring my heart into my novels in a different way, because my, my heart changed from wanting to get noticed or wanting to be famous or get on the best selling list to, I just want to, I just want to encourage other women You know, I want other women going through a divorce or a different hard season to one, be entertained with a good book and get out of their struggle for a couple of hours, but also have that hope um, that kind of goes back to what I said about when I started writing initially, seeing that hope from Robin Jones Gunn and Gail Roper and other authors. And so when I experienced that shift, I, I became unafraid of being vulnerable. 
you know, there's a lot of us on social media that want to hold back and say, oh, well, people don't need to know that. Or people might think poorly of me if they knew that I did this or went through this. But I think that's what readers relate to. They want someone who is real and who's like, yeah, this happened and this is what I learned from it. Or this is why I write about this. So I think the best marketing is just being yourself and being genuine. And some people, of course, they're not going to like it or respond to it. But I think overall, that's where you get the most interaction. It's just yeah. putting putting yourself out there. And there's a balance. We don't air all of our dirty laundry, of course. <laughs> but just giving the reader a way to say, oh, me too, really goes a long way. Yeah. Yeah. I have to say that probably the most uh, common response that I get to my newsletters when I send out the email newsletter is if I put at the bottom and I, I always just sort of have it as a, almost like a PS, but above my name. Um, you know, this is what I'm reading right now. What are you reading? And everybody wants to talk about what they're reading, you know? <laughs> and then yeah. a lot of times, you know, in the next newsletter, I'll be like, you know, Joe M is reading, you know, Stephen King's The Stand and, you know, Betsy S is rereading her book, Tacos for Two. <laughs> and, and people love that too. And so, um, and it's fun for me and, you know, it's kind of great to get a whole list of, I mean, there are more books to read than you could read in many lifetimes, but even just your to be read pile, like I'm never going to get through that because I keep adding more books to it all the time anyway. <laughs> oh, same, same. Right. Oh man. But yeah, I, I think that's true. Like anytime you can ask your readers a question or, or get feedback from them, I think that really goes a long way. At the end of every newsletter, I'll do a giveaway. It might be a gift card. It might be a book, one of my books, a friend's book, you know, some kind of giveaway, but to enter the giveaway, I have them answer a question and just email me their answer. And that's what gets them entered. And I will wake up. I have to time it right because I will wake up the next morning to one to 200 email responses answering a question. And it might be something really surface level and fun. Like, do you like cilantro or do you not like cilantro? You know, hate it. Hate uh, it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or sometimes I'll go deeper and say, what's something you're struggling with right now? Or what's, you know, a prayer request or what's, um, you know, one thing that you're just really grateful for in this season, you know, just to get people interacting and thinking. And um, in a lot of ways, that's turned a little bit into a ministry. I'm, I've been able to really um, encourage some, some readers and, and pray for them. And, you know, that's all part of why I write. So for me, that's just a win-win, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I really do love um, talking with my readers. A lot of times I feel uh, because I tend to be in general, like I, I almost can't write a short story. I can't, I literally can't write a short email. If I do write a short email, I feel really bad. Like somebody on the other end is going to be like, man, is Kitty just like not want to talk to me today? Is yeah. a three sentence yeah. email. You know? So rude. It does. I know. Right? Yes. I need emojis. Like I need all of it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Oh, and by the way, I really would love to see uh, just a copy of a page of your book that has the emojis in it. I have the NetGalley ebook oh, and it just comes it right up here. as little squares. So there's no emojis. I Do will you, show you right here. You have I have the book okay. in my hand. All right, me, everybody me... move over to YouTube if you're not there now. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna get it really close. Let's see. So I can all right. get it close. Where am I gonna look? The middle of the page? The oh, in the middle, there's some emojis. Yeah. Oh, Oh my gosh. All right. So People, you can need to get the print copy. Obviously this is, I mean, I I'm sure in the final ebook copy, they, they must've fixed it. Just my net galley copy didn't have it. Yeah. I think there was some issues with that. And if you're listening to the audio book, you kind of miss out on the, the visual <sighs> aesthetic too. Right. Um, I, I wondered how the audio was going to sound. I listened to part of it the other day and the voice actress did a great job because there's so many scenes where it is written like a text message or a direct message, you know, yeah. with, um, for those not watching, it's, you know, the, the format is just like on a phone or a computer where the texting is staggered from left to right. So, you know, who's talking and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so it, whenever the, the voice actress was reading those texts, I thought it went really well. I was nervous. I was like, how is she going to do this? Yeah. <laughs> you know, saying the, the usernames, the, the handles, you know, yeah. Um, but it, it sounded very natural. So I love the audiobook. I think it came out great. Oh, nice. Nice. Now, 
I was just going to ask you a question and then I got to listening to you. You know, you're supposed to be an active listener. So I really was listening to you and now I forgot what I was going to ask you, oh, no. but it had to do. Yes. Okay. So back to food. Sorry. Sorry. Just, yes. I'm, I just feel like we need to be friends for life because we both love putting food in our romantic comedies. <laughs> All right. Absolutely. So my questions are, um, did you actually find somebody who would give you a little, it would have to be a very mini tour, a mini tour of their food truck or teach you anything about uh, tacos and Mexican food making or anything like that? Did you, well, did you learn it or, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. I had it. I had a tour set up for a local taco truck here in town. They also have a storefront. And then COVID hit because oh. I was writing this book in 2020. That was my, my writing period for the deadline. So everything just got a little messed up. So I had to really just online research. And then of course I talked to um, some friends who I knew, um, like we have a family friend, they make their own salsa and sell it seasonally. Um, so like I talked to him about some of his salsa experiences, you know, and then um, I would research authentic Mexican food, um, recipes. So tamales, and then I'm totally going to mess up the pronunciation of this, but I think it's patole. It's the Mexican soup that is also in the novel. Um, so I did a lot of research and you should have seen my Google search history for a little while. It was hilarious. <laughs> I would, I would research, is this pepper spicy enough to burn your eyes? And, you know, like, People think yeah. I'm probably playing torture, you know? Um, so yeah, it didn't quite go as planned, but I think it worked out well. And um, I did have some, some, uh, a couple of people as like first readers who are very familiar with that culture, you know, read a couple of things and make sure I didn't totally mess it up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have to say some of my best research has been going to my own Facebook page and saying, okay, people. Um, and, and I had uh, told you this, you know, earlier because sometimes it's just too weird the way things can happen at the same time. I am actually in the middle of writing uh, a story about a Mexican man and his family's food truck and the social media manager who, uh, you know, tweets something that yeah. really ticks him off. And so, but it's set in my old hometown during Cherry Festival. There's a big food truck kind of thing going on there now. In fact, um, it's become a real, Traverse City, Michigan has become a real foodie place since I left. I'm like, dang it, why wasn't it foodie when I lived there? <laughs> oh, it's so sad. <laughs> I know, but every time I go back, I'm like, oh my gosh, more new things to try. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's great. But I, I was like, listen, people, I need to know, does anybody own a food truck or know someone who's owned a food truck, particularly if the food truck has ever been to Traverse City, you know, because it's a small yeah. town. So it's like, you know, there are only certain places that you can, you know, legally park the truck and that sort of thing. How right. do permits make, uh, work? You know, um, how yeah. big is the interior of the truck? How many people can literally stand inside the truck? You know? Yeah. Like it had all these questions and, you know, people are like, oh, I have a friend who's Mexican and a chef. And one time worked in a food truck. I'm like, please message him and ask him if I can talk yes. to him, stuff like that. It's so much fun. Honestly, I think the research sometimes is as much fun as the writing. It really is. I, um, for years I've freelanced, um, journal, I'm a freelance journalist for a, a community newspaper ah. and this community newspaper is more like recreational announcements and, life advice and, you know, festivals and it's, it's, it's all lighthearted, happy. It's not news news. Yeah. And so it's really fun to get to write features. Um, we'll feature local authors, we'll feature, um, new businesses. Um, and so there's been some really neat connections come through some of these different writing assignments I've been given over the years. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with, um, Sarah Evans, the country singer. Oh, she, um, Yes. One of the other Ravel authors was the co-author for her first book. Yes. Rachel, Rachel. Rachel. Yeah. Yes. So, um, I got to talk to Sarah Evans on the phone to interview her because she was coming to a big festival, a, a music festival we were having in Shreveport. And this was years ago. And it was hilarious because I was going through a breakup. It was my first breakup post-divorce, you know, just a attempt at a new, at a new relationship gone wrong. And I had to call her and be professional and go through all these interview questions. Well, she's at the doctor's office with her kid, you know, so she's in the waiting room <laughs> talking to me and I'm like, yeah, 
sorry, I'm going through a breakup right now. And she's like, oh, honey, I'll pray for you. And I'm like, oh, and like, it was just the best conversation. I'm like, is this happening right now? Right. (laughs) I'm all for the research and getting to know new people. And I think that's one of the best things of, of writing is getting to learn and experience something you would never get to. And then letting your readers experience it when you write it. Yeah. 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 They so, say, write what you know, like that's always the first piece of writing advice, right? It's like, write what you know. And I'm like, no, like learn and then write about that. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and I have actually uh, heard both of them write about what uh, makes you passionate and interested. So yeah, you and I food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, Did you Coffee. try any of the recipes that you looked up? I have not because I know my limitations. <laughs> You and I really are like sisters. <laughs> so I passed all the cooking and baking genes. They went right through me and straight to my daughter. So oh, wow. my eighth grader, she like, for example, a couple of months ago, she's like, I'm just going to, I'm just going to make some macarons. I'm like, okay, baby. I was like, that's really tricky. Like that depends on the weather and the stars aligning. Like that's hard. And I was like, you can try, but like, just be prepared. It might not come out the way you want, you know? And she comes, she comes out of the kitchen an hour and a half later with these like perfect macarons. And she's like, what? Like, it's hard. And I'm like, great. <laughs> she just did it. Um, so she's the one who will try the new recipes. Or if I'm, um, if I say, yeah, I'm going to make chicken spaghetti tonight. She'll kind of side eye me and she'll be like, do you want me to make the chicken? <laughs> And I'm like, yeah, you probably should. I'll just boil the water and pour the noodles in. <laughs> nice. So, yeah. yeah. My husband and I have decided, um, well, I have so many stories to share because he's adorable and I adore him and yes, I Aww. just love him. So, <laughs> um, and we have a lot of years of stories, but the, the, the short version is, is that we have both found out very quickly in our marriage that, um, he is the person who cooks the actual food that is healthy and good for you. I do the fun baking stuff. <laughs> oh, good. That's perfect. <laughs> it does work out pretty well. Um, you know, I'm a, a little heavier than I really should be, but <laughs> it's, uh, it he makes, it that. <laughs> oh gosh, he makes the most amazing chocolate chip peanut butter pancakes like on earth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Come over sometime and we will make pancakes. Yes. He, he will make pancakes. <laughs> if I, if I told my husband today, Hey, we're going to go to Sweden for pancakes. He'd probably just look at me for a minute and then be like, all right, let's get, let's get on Delta. Let's book the flight. (laughs) Should totally do it. When we were deciding and it was really kind of, I mean, it it was his choice, whether or not he wanted this job, but it was our choice, whether or not we were going to move to another country that, um, that wasn't in uh, English as the primary language country. Um, And we were walking around talking about various things. And um, one of the things was, I just did it again. <laughs> like I'm thinking about you and your husband and I'm like, what? I'm just like kind of goofy today. Sorry, people. When you're listening, I hope you enjoy this. Otherwise <laughs> Great. This real life, real life yeah. author brain. <laughs> yes. But this, you know what? And so this is how author brains work. You know, you're thinking yes. of a story and then you're in the middle of things and, and it's sort of yes. like a dream sequence. You're just kind of hopping from one thing to another. Absolutely. And always write it down. If you think I'll remember that later, you will not write it down. Like yeah. when you're brainstorming or plotting, do not trust yourself. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, I, I have thought of things after I have already written the thing and I'm like, well, now I remembered it, but I already wrote it a different way. So it's too bad. <laughs> too bad. Uh, but yes, one of the things we were thinking about when we moved to Sweden was, well, how how could there be anything wrong with a country that has national cinnamon bun day and national waffle day? Yes. 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 We just went on a waffle tour unofficially. (laughs) Tell me more. We kind of made our own. We made our own. So my husband was always a pancake guy. I mean, he has this whole process. He, when he gets his, 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 his breakfast, he'll pour the syrup on the pancakes and then set it aside to let it soak while he eats the rest of his breakfast. And then he comes back. It's very, very <laughs> important. Um, so he's always been a pancake guy. Well, I started getting into more of the waffles because one, waffles are superior. They have pockets to hold your syrup. 
and somehow they're less calories. I guess it's a density issue, but every time I looked on the menu, the waffles were half the calories of the pancakes. I'm like, okay, well, every little bit helps, you know, right. <laughs> um, I can justify this breakfast now. Um, <laughs> so he finally tried the waffle recently. I was like, oh, okay. What have I been missing? So we just went out of town to Dallas just to kind of get away for a weekend. And we had waffles. Like we weren't just going for breakfast. We went for waffles. We actually started at one place. Their waffle machine was broken. So we put down some, I'm sorry, we're this way cash on the table and left. Yeah. <laughs> like, this is who we are as, as people now. Um, and went to find a different working waffle place, ate breakfast there. And then every morning while we were gone, even the day we came home, we found another waffle somewhere and we called it our waffle tour. <laughs> so, nice. Yeah. It was so great. Like he would scour the the online menus to make sure they had waffles before we would go. It could be five star, amazing rating, you know, little breakfast cafe. Nope. If there was not a waffle on the menu, like he knows what he wants. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can be that way with a few things. I found uh, a coffee shop that has dark chocolate cocoa as opposed to milk chocolate, hot chocolate. Mm -hmm. um, and part of the way that it's made is there's a giant ball of dark chocolate on a stick and that goes oh. into the milk and you just wait for it to melt and keep on stirring. And I'm like, Oh my yes. gosh. Why, had, is everything, why is everything better on a stick? I, <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> but one time, uh, I think it was last week I went in, I'm like, I need the dark chocolate cocoa. And then they were like, Oh, sorry, we're out. We have the milk chocolate. I'm like, no. Okay. Thank you. Goodbye. I'm sorry. You go stand in line for 15 minutes. I'm like, I'm sorry. I have to go now. <laughs> like I have standards. Okay. That's right. <laughs> now, Betsy, I don't know if anybody else is thinking this, but um, people are, are you thinking to yourself, I need to put Betsy and her husband as characters in some of my books. <laughs> May we have your permission? We'll change the names to protect the innocent sure. or the guilty. <laughs> yes. There'll be a rush of waffle tours and fiction novels in 2023. <laughs> yeah. You know, honestly, I'm pretty sure that I'm going to do the pancake syrup set aside, eat my bowl of cereal. That's going to be what I want to use. <laughs> he swears by it. To me, I'm like, Ooh, it's too soggy. And he's like, Oh no, you don't know what you're missing. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Listen, this has been super fun. I'm so glad that, um, well, I hope everybody else is enjoying this because I am totally enjoying <laughs> talking to you. Yes, it's been great. Oh, and, um, you know what, I'm sure that you have, uh, tons of other uh, advice for writers because you, you are a speaker on your website and I think that you do some more things. Um, tell us a little bit about you, where people can find you in your books online and, and if you're going to be any place live and in person. <laughs> Yeah. So I'm in the middle of setting up a book signing here in Shreveport at Barnes and Noble. Um, we don't have an official date on the calendar yet, but if you're local or within driving distance, um, head on over and subscribe to my newsletter. I can keep you posted on all of those details. I'm also um, about to be announcing some future books and coming soon contracts. So you don't want to miss that. Um, you can sign up for my newsletter on my website, which is just BetsySaintAmont.com. Uh, there's no period after the saint, just Betsy Sainamont.com. Yes. And um, I love, like I said, I, 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 I'm like the newsletter Santa Claus. I just give stuff away on my newsletter. So come uh, join us. And then I'm also on social media, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under Betsy Sainamont or Betsy Sainamont Haddocks. Some are, you have to kind of look for, look for both. Um, but I have all the links on my newsletter. If you just want to click there. Excellent. Um, but yeah, and I, I, I do speaking, I'm available for, you know, book club, Zooms or in person, any of that kind of stuff. I just love interacting with readers and other writers. And I also offer editing on the side. So you can contact me through my website if you're looking for a freelance edit of a query letter, a proposal, whatever you're working on right now. If you want to get another pair of eyes before you submit your novel, to an agent or an editor, you can um, look into that with, with me. I'd be happy to help. So that's me. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Now I'll have the, the link to your website in the show notes for the show here, but let's just uh, spell out your whole name so that people listening can um, just go ahead and, and enter it into their phone or computer. Sure. So it's Betsy, B-E-T-S-Y, 
St. Amant, S-T period, A-M-A-N-T. But again, the website does not have the period. Excellent. And uh, for some of the social media, it might have uh, one more last name, which is Haddox, H-A-D-D-O-X. That was my married name that I acquired about four years ago. Um, But you know how it is. You already have your whole backlist of books as St. Amant. So I'm having to kind of get readers familiar with the Haddocks, but when it comes to my novels, we're, we're keeping St. Amon on the cover just to keep it simple. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Consistent and all that. Yeah. Awesome. Well, listen, I will make sure to uh, put links in the show notes as well, but now people can just go straight there. I don't know the number of times that I've been listening to a podcast and gone pause, go over to Safari or Google Chrome and <laughs> type it in. I need to know right now. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show. It's been a real pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me. And for all of you listeners out there, go drink some coffee and write something amazing. 